In 1993, I was living out of my beat-up old car. Not the best life plan, I know, but when you've been laid off from three different jobs in two years, you start thinking that maybe stability is overrated. A little unpredictability can keep things interesting. Or so I kept telling myself while I ate canned beans and slept on a foam mattress in the back of my 1986 Ford Escort. My name's Joel Ransom. Funny, right? Ransom. A guy with no steady job, no permanent home, no one to care if he gets snatched off the street. I was a freelance mechanic back then, picking up odd jobs wherever my car broke down, which, given the state of that car, was pretty often. But it was also a kind of freedom I couldn't complain about too much. No rent, no boss breathing down my neck. Just me in the road, with my one rule. Never stay in one place too long. That rule worked well for me. Until I found myself deep in the backwoods of Kentucky, somewhere around the Daniel Boone National Forest. I'd stopped for gas in a little town called Hayfield, and one of the locals mentioned there was a junkyard nearby that paid well for scrap metal. Junkyards were gold mines for me. I could usually fix up an old alternator or strip an engine for parts, flip it for some cash, and be on my way before anyone even knew I was there. So that's where I was heading. Or at least that's where I thought I was heading. GPS didn't exactly work out in that part of the world, and I'm no master of reading road signs when they're covered in moss and rust. After about an hour of winding through dirt roads, my engine started making a noise, an expensive noise. I pulled over to pop the hood, and that's when I saw it. My radiator was leaking fluid all over the dirt, steaming like the car was about to melt into the ground. A quick patch-up job could get me a few more miles, I figured, so I started working on it. That's when I noticed something strange. At first it was just a smell, something like wet dog, but worse, mixed with iron maybe. Blood? I couldn't place it, but it was strong enough to make me pause. Then, I heard movement. Slow, deliberate movement, like something big trying to stay quiet. I stood up, looking around the dense trees surrounding the road. No wind, no birds. The whole place had gone still, like the forest was holding its breath. Now, I've been in plenty of sketchy situations. Lived through a couple of mugging attempts in Chicago, narrowly escaped a bar fight in Nevada, but this? This was different. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and I felt this weird pressure, like the air itself was thickening around me. Still, I wasn't about to run from a smell and some rustling leaves. Not yet, anyway. I grabbed my wrench, mostly for show, and called out into the trees. Maybe it was a bear or a coyote, I thought. Something I could scare off if I made enough noise. That's when I saw it. It stepped out from between two trees about thirty yards ahead. I say stepped, but the movement was all wrong. Too smooth. Too intentional. At first glance, I thought it was a big wolf. But no wolf stands on two legs. And no wolf has arms like that. Long, muscular, covered in matted fur but shaped more like human limbs than anything I'd ever seen on four paws. Its head was something else entirely, a broad, flat snout like a hyena, but with a row of jagged teeth that gleamed, catching just enough light through the trees to make me freeze in place. And then it snarled. I've always hated people who freeze in horror movies. You know, the ones who see something terrifying and just stand there waiting to be eaten? Well, turns out that's exactly what you do when something that looks like it came out of a nightmare steps out of the shadows. Your brain just stops working for a second. Maybe longer. By the time my body started listening to my brain again, the thing had taken a step closer, and then another. I backed up slowly, heart pounding so hard I thought I'd pass out. And then, like the worst possible timing in the history of bad timing, the wrench slipped out of my sweaty hand and clattered to the ground. That was all it needed. It charged. Now I'm not what you'd call a fast runner. Let's just say years of gas station food and truck stop coffee haven't exactly done wonders for my cardiovascular health. But that day, I ran like I was 15 pounds lighter and had a chance at the Olympics. I could hear it behind me, its footsteps heavy and fast, tearing through the underbrush like a freight train. My car was about 20 feet away. I didn't even look back. Just threw myself inside, slammed the door, and locked it. Like a locked door was going to stop that thing. Still, it was the only plan I had. For a second, I thought maybe it had given up. The woods went silent again. I couldn't hear anything but my own breath coming in short, panicked gasps. 
I was about to relax, tell myself it was all in my head, when the entire car rocked sideways. It had jumped on the roof. I'm not proud of the scream I let out in that moment. I'm also not proud of the fact that I pissed myself a little. But if you had a 300-pound monster trying to peel the roof off your car like a sardine can, you'd probably do the same. I fumbled for the keys, started the engine, and slammed on the gas. The wheels spun in the dirt for a second before catching, and the car lurched forward. For a brief, glorious moment, I thought I was home free. Then the back window shattered. I'm not sure if it was adrenaline or pure dumb luck that kept me from driving off the road. I floored it, swerving down the narrow path, while the thing clawed at the metal roof, tearing off pieces of the car like it was made of tin foil. I could hear its claws scraping against the metal, trying to get inside. Then, as suddenly as it had started, the sound stopped. I didn't slow down. I didn't even look back. I just drove until the road finally spat me out onto a highway, and even then, I didn't stop. Not until I reached a gas station on the outskirts of the next town. When I got out, the first thing I noticed was that my hands were shaking so badly I could barely turn the key to lock the car. The second thing I noticed was the claw marks. Deep, jagged scratches running across the roof, the hood, even the doors. The back window was completely smashed in, and inside there was something wet on the seats. Blood. Not mine. I didn't want to know where it came from. I went inside the gas station, still shaking, and asked the guy behind the counter if there was a mechanic nearby. He didn't even look up from his magazine when he told me the nearest garage was 30 miles away. So I bought a soda, sat in my car, and just tried to breathe. That night I parked in a motel lot, locked the doors, and slept in the front seat. Yeah, I had enough cash for a room, but after what I'd seen, there was no way I was sleeping in a bed surrounded by four walls. At least in the car I could see all my exits. The next morning I took the car to a body shop. The guy there, Jim or something, looked at the damage and asked if I'd hit a tree or something. I just nodded. No way in hell was I going to explain what really happened. Even I didn't believe it, and I was there. I sold that car a week later, got a couple hundred bucks for it from a scrapyard out in the middle of nowhere. Funny thing, though, when I was talking to the guy who bought it, he mentioned he'd seen scratches like that before. Said they came from something big. I didn't ask what. I got a new car after that, and I never went back to Kentucky. But every now and then, when I hear something rustling in the woods or catch a whiff of that wet dog smell, I wonder... Maybe it's still out there, lurking in those woods, waiting for the next dumbass to wander into its territory. Or maybe it moved on, found better hunting grounds. Either way, I'm not about to find out. I was in Arkansas when it happened, the kind of place that makes you question why you'd ever want to visit the woods alone. I remember it was 2004 because my buddy Max had just bought his first real truck and we decided we'd take a weekend trip to celebrate. I'm Brian Hauser, a mechanic by trade, and I don't get out of town much unless someone's dragging me along. Max was the outdoorsy type. Me? Not so much. But I'd spent too many weekends fixing up old engines to say no when he pitched camping in the Ozark National Forest. Big mistake. Max and I weren't exactly close growing up, but after high school, he stuck around and we became decent friends. He always pushed me to do things outside of my comfort zone, which wasn't hard to do. I liked a good laugh, liked cracking jokes about how we were more likely to get eaten by mosquitoes than anything else. And for a while, that's all it felt like. Just another weekend. But I can't shake the smell of those woods. The air was damp, heavy with the stench of rot. It wasn't even raining, but everything felt soggy. Max thought it was perfect, kept going on about the peace and quiet, how it felt good to be away from the noise of the city. I didn't mind the quiet, not at first until it got too quiet. That's the thing about the woods. You don't realize how unsettling silence can be until you're in the middle of it. We set up camp near a clearing, a spot Max swore up and down was the best place for a fire. We spent the first night drinking cheap beer telling stupid jokes and roasting hot dogs over the flames. 
Max kept insisting on telling some ghost story he'd heard from a ranger a few years back. Something about hikers going missing in the area. I told him to shove it. I wasn't interested in hearing ghost stories in the middle of nowhere. Max laughed, said I was scared of my own shadow, and we moved on to talking about the good old days. But deep down, something about the place felt off. It wasn't anything I could put my finger on. Maybe it was the way the wind barely moved the trees, or how the birds seemed to vanish right after sunset. Maybe it was just being out of my element. Or maybe it was the stench we started noticing as the night wore on. It wasn't the smell of the fire. No, this was something else. Something rancid, like the carcass of an animal that had been left to rot. I joked that Max had probably brought some roadkill with him for extra flavor, but he wasn't laughing. Max had gone quiet, staring out into the darkness just beyond the firelight. We didn't hear anything. No crunching of leaves, no footsteps, nothing. But that stench hung in the air, thick and nauseating. I grabbed a flashlight, thinking maybe there was a dead animal nearby. Max was right behind me though his usual bravado had shrunk. We scanned the area, circling the camp, but found nothing. Then something moved, quick, just outside the beam of light. I swung the flashlight over, catching a glimpse of... something. It was fast, too fast for me to make out. I couldn't shake the feeling that it wasn't an animal. Max started cursing, grabbing for his hunting knife, the one he always brought along, just in case. He wasn't laughing anymore we should have left right then. Packed up, hiked back to the truck and gone home. But Max wanted to stay. Thought it might just be a raccoon or maybe a deer. We had food out. It was probably nothing, he said. I wasn't convinced, but I didn't want to be the guy who bailed on a camping trip because he got spooked by a rustle in the bushes. So we stayed. That night, I didn't sleep much. I kept hearing noises, soft shuffling, the sound of something dragging along the ground. Max was snoring away in his tent, oblivious to it all. I lay there trying to convince myself it was nothing, that the woods were playing tricks on me. But then, just before dawn, I heard it. A scream. I've heard people scream before. You live long enough, you hear all kinds of things. But this was different. This wasn't the scream of someone in pain or fear. This was raw like the sound of someone who's lost everything. It cut through the trees, echoing, bouncing off the rocks and branches until I couldn't tell where it was coming from. It was close, though. Too close. I jumped out of the tent, tripping over myself as I scrambled for the flashlight. Max was already outside, his knife in hand, eyes wide and frantic. He'd heard it, too. Without saying a word, we started packing up, moving faster than I thought possible. The sun hadn't even risen yet, and all I could think about was getting out of there. That's when I saw it. It wasn't a bear. God, I wish it had been a bear. It stood on two legs, taller than any person I'd ever seen. The thing's body was covered in matted fur, dark and clumped together like it hadn't seen water in years. Its head... Well, that's where the comparisons to any animal I knew ended. It was wide. Too wide. With a snout that jutted forward like a wolf's. But longer more deformed, and the teeth, Jesus, the teeth, rows of jagged, uneven fangs that looked like they could rip through anything. I didn't even scream. I just froze, staring at it as it stared back at me. Max, on the other hand, wasn't waiting around to get a better look. He bolted, leaving the gear, leaving me, everything. He didn't even shout my name, just took off. That's when it lunged. Not at him, but at me. I don't remember much after that, just the feel of the ground hitting my back and the flash of pain as its claws raked across my chest. I must have blacked out because the next thing I knew I was lying on the ground, my shirt soaked in blood. Max was nowhere to be seen, the thing was gone too. Somehow I got up, I don't know how, but I did. Stumbling back toward the campsite, I saw the mess it had left behind. The tents were shredded, food scattered everywhere. But the worst part was what I found near the edge of the clearing. Bones. Not just animal bones. Human bones. Picked clean. Piled up like someone had been collecting them. I didn't stick around to figure out whose bones they were. I made it back to the truck, barely. I half expected to find Max there, hiding, waiting for me. But he wasn't. The truck was empty, the keys still in the ignition. I thought about leaving without him. Hell, I should've. 
but I didn't. I waited. It was around noon when I heard him. Max stumbled out of the woods looking worse than I did. His clothes were torn, blood dried on his face, and his eyes... Well, let's just say I didn't recognize him anymore. He didn't say a word, just got into the truck and we drove. Neither of us looked back. We never talked about it after that. I don't know what happened to Max. Last I heard, he moved out west, got into some kind of survivalist group. Me? I went back to the shop, kept my head down. But I can't forget that smell, that stench. Sometimes it creeps into the garage and I find myself looking over my shoulder, half expecting to see that thing standing there, waiting. People ask me why I don't go camping anymore. I usually tell them I'm just not an outdoors guy. They say the worst thing you can do is trust a stranger, but they never tell you what happens when you can't trust the ones you know. That's how I ended up here, in this damn mess. It was 2003, and I was driving through the back roads of West Virginia, figuring that maybe, just maybe, I could handle the wilderness a bit better than I could handle people. Name's Curtis Langford, and for as long as I can remember, I've always had a way of finding trouble. This time, though, it wasn't my fault, or so I like to think. I was visiting my cousin Jim out in Logan County, a good guy, but a bit too fond of living in the middle of nowhere for my liking. We had planned to spend a weekend hunting. Jim talked about these woods like they were something special, like they held secrets worth discovering. If there was anything I should have learned by now, it's that secrets in a place like Logan are never good. We were out in the deep parts of the forest, far from any paved roads or cell service. Jim had an old cabin that he swore was perfect for getting away from it all. Disconnect, he said. I just wanted a few days to clear my head, maybe shoot a deer or two and call it a week. But what I got was something else entirely. The first day, things felt normal enough. Jim and I hiked out to an overlook. Rifles slung over our shoulders, swapping stories and shooting the breeze like we always did. He pointed out landmarks, talked about the Appalachian history around these parts, like it was more alive than the present. Something in the way he spoke, though, gave me the feeling that he was leading up to something bigger. Jim was always a bit of a storyteller, but I swear the way he looked out at those mountains, it was like they were watching us back. When we got back to the cabin, there was a thick tension in the air that neither of us addressed. It wasn't anything I could put a finger on, just a gut feeling like being watched. I brushed it off. I was tired, sore, and a little drunk on the whiskey we packed. I figured paranoia comes naturally with that combination. But when we sat by the fire later that night, Jim started acting strange, distant. His eyes kept darting out into the tree line, and he was quieter than usual. By the second day, I knew something was up. The woods felt wrong, like the air was heavier or something. Even the birds had stopped making noise. Jim kept glancing over his shoulder like he expected someone or something was about to step out of the trees. I finally asked him what the hell was going on. There's something out here, Curtis, Jim said, his voice low like he didn't want the trees to hear him. Something that ain't right. I rolled my eyes, thinking it was another one of his tall tales. I mean, what could possibly be out here in the middle of nowhere that we couldn't handle? But Jim wasn't smiling, and for the first time in years, I saw real fear in his eyes. We packed up and hiked a bit deeper into the woods that morning hoping to find some good game. The deeper we went, the quieter it got. It was unnerving, sure, but nothing to get bent out of shape over, until we stumbled across something I wish I had never seen. At first I thought it was just a pile of brush, maybe some animal carcass that had been dragged out. But as we got closer, the smell hit us. Blood. Fresh blood. The body was torn apart in a way I'd never seen before, like it had been ripped apart by something strong, something with teeth far bigger than anything in these parts. Jim crouched beside it, his face pale. It's been happening more often, he muttered, more to himself than to me. What's been happening more often, I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. I was ready for him to say wolves, maybe a bear, something that made sense. Instead, he said, people go missing. No one talks about it, but the locals know. 
There's something in these woods, Curtis. I shook my head, refusing to believe it. You're just trying to scare me. Jim didn't say anything. He just stood, shouldering his rifle and started walking again. That night, back at the cabin, the unease set in deeper. Jim wouldn't sit still. Every time the wind blew, every time a branch snapped, his fingers twitched toward his rifle. The fire crackled, casting long shadows against the walls, but it didn't feel warm. I made a few jokes to lighten the mood. Something about how maybe we should have packed more whiskey if he was going to keep acting like this. He didn't laugh. It wasn't until sometime after midnight that the banging started. At first I thought it was just the wind, but then it came again. Louder. More deliberate. Jim grabbed his rifle, motioning for me to stay quiet. We didn't move, didn't breathe. Then came the scraping sound. It was like nails or claws dragging against the cabin walls, slow and deliberate. Jim's eyes were wide, his knuckles white as he gripped his gun. I whispered, what the hell is that? He didn't answer. Instead, he moved toward the window, peeking out into the darkness, his face drained of color. We need to leave. I didn't argue. I grabbed my pack and rifle, and we moved as fast as we could without making a sound. The cabin door creaked as we opened it, and the cold night air slapped me in the face. There was something in the trees, a shadow moving too fast for me to get a good look. We didn't make it more than a few steps before the thing came barreling out of the woods, fast as hell. I didn't get a good look at it, just teeth, fur, and a blur of motion. It hit Jim first, knocking him to the ground. His rifle went off, the shot echoing through the trees. I froze, my mind racing, but my body refusing to move. Jim screamed, a gurgling horrible sound as the thing tore into him. It was a werewolf, or something like it. Bigger than any wolf I'd ever seen, muscles rippling under its matted fur, jaws snapping with a force that could break bone in seconds. I don't remember making the decision to run. One minute I was standing there, the next I was tearing through the forest like my life depended on it. Because it did. I didn't look back, I didn't hear Jim anymore. Just the sound of my boots pounding against the earth and my heartbeat in my ears. I don't know how far I ran before I realized I was alone, my breath ragged, my legs burning. I collapsed against a tree, my chest heaving as I tried to catch my breath. The forest was silent again, the only sound the wind rustling through the leaves. That's when I heard it, a low chuckle from behind me. I turned, expecting the worst. But what I saw was somehow more terrifying. A man, or what was left of one, stood there grinning. His skin hung loosely, stretched tight over bones that didn't seem to fit right like he was wearing someone else's body. His eyes. No, I couldn't see his eyes. And I didn't want to. You can't outrun it, he rasped, his voice barely more than a whisper. It'll find you. It always does. Before I could react, he was gone melting back into the trees like he had never been there. I don't know if he was real, or if my mind was playing tricks on me after everything I'd just seen. But I didn't wait to find out. I stumbled my way back to the cabin, my legs weak and trembling. The door was hanging off its hinges and the inside was a mess. Blood streaked the floor. Jim's rifle lay abandoned in the corner, and the fire had long since gone out. I found him, or what was left of him, in the back. It wasn't much just scraps of meat and bone. I couldn't tell where Jim ended and the animal began. I didn't stay long after that. I grabbed what I could and ran until I found the nearest road. I don't know what that thing was, but I do know one thing for sure. Jim was right. There's something in those woods, something that doesn't belong, and it's still out there. I went back to Logan County once more after that, not because I wanted to, but because I had to. There were more bodies, ripped apart the same way. Some hikers had gone missing, and the authorities were talking about a rogue bear, but I knew better. You can tell yourself whatever you want to make sense of it, but me? I just don't go back to those woods. There's something about waking up in a strange place that messes with your head. It's like your brain hasn't quite caught up with where you are. And for a few seconds, you're stuck between where you were and where you are now. It's disorienting. 
That's how I felt when I woke up in the cabin off the beaten path in Arkansas. It was 2004, and I was just looking for a place to decompress for a few days. The name's Ben Talbot, and I've always been the kind of guy who needs space to breathe. I've been a long-haul trucker for 13 years now, and there's something comforting about being on the road. It's all straightforward. Pick up the load, drop it off, repeat. No drama, no BS. Well, at least, until you park the rig and the miles behind you start feeling heavy. Sometimes it's not the miles you carry that weigh you down, it's the things you've seen along the way. I came to this cabin because my old buddy Mark insisted I take a break. He'd found this place during a hunting trip and said it was the perfect spot to clear your head. No cell service, no noise, just you and the trees, he told me. Sounded perfect, right? That was before I knew what really lurked out here. I got to the cabin late in the afternoon, unloaded my gear, and took a deep breath of the pine-scented air. It was peaceful, like I'd hoped, but there was something else, too. You ever get the feeling like someone's watching you? That prickle on the back of your neck that doesn't let you relax? I shook it off, figured it was just me being paranoid after months of non-stop driving. The cabin wasn't anything fancy, just a small shack with enough space to stretch out, a creaky bed, and a fireplace that looked like it hadn't been used in years. I wasn't here for luxury, though. I was here for quiet. The first night passed without incident, which was surprising. I've got a history with nightmares. You see some messed up things on the road. Accidents, bodies, things no one should have to witness. But that night, I slept like a rock. It wasn't until the second night that things started to go south. I'd spent the day exploring the woods, just me and my thoughts. By the time I got back to the cabin, the sun was dipping low, casting long shadows between the trees. I built a fire, cooked up some beans, and settled into the old rocking chair with a flask of bourbon. Everything seemed calm, until the scratching started. It was subtle at first, like a branch scraping against the side of the cabin. I ignored it, chalked it up to the wind, but the scratching got louder, more insistent. I stood up, grabbed my flashlight, and opened the door to see what it was. Nothing. Just the trees swaying gently in the breeze. I shook my head, muttering to myself, and went back inside. But the sound didn't stop. In fact, it got worse. The scratches turned into heavy thuds, like someone, or something, was hitting the walls from the outside. My first thought was a bear. They'd been spotted in these parts before, but this didn't sound like a bear. The noise was too deliberate, too... calculated. I locked the door and sat there, listening. The thuds circled the cabin, slow and steady, like whatever was out there was trying to get in, but taking its time with it. Now, I'm not a guy who scares easy. I've had close calls on the road, been in bar fights, even had a knife pulled on me once. But this... this was something different. I didn't sleep that night. I just sat there, clutching the fireplace poker like it was a lifeline, waiting for the thing to make its move. But it didn't. Not yet. The next morning, I stepped outside, fully expecting to see claw marks or some other sign of what had been out there. But the cabin looked untouched. I stood there, scanning the tree line, feeling more on edge than I wanted to admit. My truck was still parked where I left it, but for some reason I didn't feel like leaving just yet. Stupid in hindsight, but something about the whole situation had me curious. I had to know what was out there. Later that day, I decided to hike deeper into the woods. The trees got thicker, the air colder, and the feeling of being watched intensified with every step. It wasn't long before I stumbled upon something that stopped me in my tracks. At first glance, it looked like an old, overgrown hunting blind. But as I got closer, I realized it was something else entirely. It was a crude shack, pieced together with rotting wood and covered in moss. The smell hit me before I even stepped inside like rotting meat mixed with damp earth. Curiosity got the better of me, so I pushed the door open. The interior was dark, but my flashlight cut through the gloom, revealing what was left behind. Animal bones, mostly. Deer, rabbits, a few others I couldn't quite identify. But then, I saw it. In the corner, half buried under a pile of leaves and debris, was something unmistakably human. A skull picked clean, with tufts of hair still clinging to it. I backed out of the shack, heart pounding, bile rising in my throat. This wasn't just some hunter's stash. 
This was a graveyard. The sun was setting by the time I made it back to the cabin, and I knew I had to leave. Whatever was out here wasn't just some animal. But when I got to my truck, the tires had been slashed. Deep gashes like something had taken a claw to them. I was stranded. That's when I heard it. A low, guttural noise, almost like a laugh, but twisted, warped in a way that made my skin crawl. I spun around, and there it was. Standing at the edge of the clearing, half-hidden in the shadows of the trees, was a creature that defied explanation. It was tall, hunched over, covered in matted fur, and its face... Its face was like a wolf's, but distorted, elongated in a way that made it look wrong. Like something that had once been human, but had been twisted into something else entirely. It didn't move at first, just watched me. Then, slowly, it stepped into the light. Its hands, or claws, I guess, were dripping with something dark. I didn't have to look too closely to know what it was. I backed toward the cabin, poker still in hand, though I knew it wouldn't do much good. The thing followed, slowly, deliberately, like it knew it had all the time in the world. It was toying with me, enjoying the fear radiating off me in waves. The creature lunged suddenly, faster than I expected, and I barely had time to react. I swung the poker wildly, catching it across the arm. It howled, not in pain, but in anger. The thing was pissed now, and I knew I was outmatched. I bolted inside the cabin, slamming the door behind me. But the creature didn't stop. It started pounding on the walls harder this time. The whole cabin shook with each blow, and I knew the door wouldn't hold for long. Desperation kicked in and I scrambled to find something, anything that could give me a fighting chance. My eyes landed on the hunting rifle mounted above the fireplace. How the hell had I missed that? I grabbed it, loaded the shells I found in the drawer and aimed at the door. When the thing finally broke through I didn't hesitate. I fired, once, twice, three times. The bullets hit their mark, tearing through its flesh but it didn't go down easily. It staggered, snarling, blood pouring from the wounds, but it kept coming. I backed up until I hit the wall, firing again and again, praying that it would be enough. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the creature collapsed at my feet, lifeless. I stood there, breathing hard, staring at the body. It was real, the thing was real. But I didn't have time to think about that. I grabbed my bag, packed what little I had, and started walking. I didn't care where, I just needed to get away from that place. The last thing I saw as I left the clearing was the creature's body, still lying there in the dirt, blood soaking into the ground. It didn't move. It didn't disappear. It just lay there, a twisted, broken thing that had once been human, or something close to it. When the cops finally found me three days later, I told them everything. I led them back to the cabin, to the shack in the woods, to the body of the creature I'd killed. They didn't believe me, of course. Said I was delusional from dehydration. But when they saw the cabin, saw the blood, saw the creature's body lying in the dirt, they went quiet. No one said a word. They took the body away, said it was some kind of deformed animal. But I knew better. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't from this world. And I hope to hell I never see anything like it again. But you know, after all that, the one thing I regret, I didn't even get to finish that flask of bourbon. I've never been good with people, which is probably why I liked working with computers. But in 2012, I made a mistake that pushed me into something far worse than a career change. I was a systems analyst. Yeah, I know, real exciting until I got laid off during some corporate reshuffling nonsense. It's like they suddenly remembered humans were still part of the equation. Not that I was much of one. You know how it goes when your life gets flipped. Panic mode, right? So, I figured I'd start fresh. There's this remote job that looked perfect. A data specialist for an isolated logging company in Montana. Pay was solid, and honestly, the idea of being far from people sounded ideal. So I packed up my car and drove out to this nowhere town called Powell Junction. There's no need to imagine it. It's exactly as dull as it sounds. One bar, a gas station, and some sad excuse for a diner. Now, I like my quiet, but Powell Junction? That place had a special kind of silence. I showed up in the middle of July, so it wasn't the dead of winter, but it felt like it. 
There was this weight in the air, like the town was holding its breath. I wasn't armed. Maybe that's the first mistake, considering what happened next. See, I'd grown up in suburban Illinois where the most dangerous thing you could face was a squirrel high on leftover Halloween candy. So why would I pack a gun? Hell, I hadn't even bought bear spray. And looking back, I really should have listened to the guy at the gas station who asked me if I was heading into the mountains and chuckled when I said yes. The logging camp was deep in the woods, about an hour's drive from the main road. My job? Simple. I was supposed to manage data logs for the logging equipment, track supplies, and make sure nobody was fudging numbers. All remote work, tucked away in a trailer they'd set up as a makeshift office on the edge of the forest. They didn't need me there all the time. Just a week every month. I figured I'd get in, do the job, then go back to whatever passed for civilization in Powell Junction. First couple of days, uneventful, just what I wanted. The guys working the camp barely talked to me and I didn't mind. It was also normal that when weird things started happening, I almost didn't notice. It began with small stuff. I'd hear noises at night outside the trailer. Not unusual for the woods, right? But these sounds weren't the rustling of leaves or a deer passing by. They were heavier. Like someone, or something, was moving through the trees, staying just out of sight. I brushed it off because I'm a grown man who's not supposed to be afraid of shadows. By the fourth night, I was sleeping less, getting jumpy over every creak or thud. The camp workers started giving me strange looks, and the foreman, an older guy named Bill who spoke with the kind of voice that sounded like he'd smoked every cigarette in Montana, asked me if I was doing okay. I lied. Of course, I said I was fine because what else was I going to say? I was hearing things. They'd laugh me out of there. The real trouble began when one of the loggers didn't show up for work. Bill said it happened sometimes. Guys would go into town, drink too much, crash at a buddy's place. But then another one disappeared the next day. I wasn't the only one getting spooked. Bill organized a small search party and I tagged along because hell, sitting in the trailer alone wasn't appealing anymore. We found the first guy, or what was left of him. He'd been torn apart. There's no other way to put it. I'm no forensic expert, but I've seen enough crime shows to know that what happened to him wasn't from a fall or some accident with the equipment. His limbs were scattered like something had ripped them clean off. I didn't throw up, but I felt like I might. Bill and the others just stared in silence before deciding to take the body back to camp. That night, the noises outside the trailer got louder, closer. I couldn't bring myself to look. I don't know if that makes me a coward or smart, but I just lay there, clutching my phone like it was a lifeline. It wasn't until I heard screaming that I jumped up and ran outside. The camp was in chaos. Men were running through the trees, shouting, shining flashlights into the dark. I caught a glimpse of something, tall, fast, and not human. It was covered in matted fur, moving on all fours like a beast but with a hunched, twisted form that reminded me of those old-time carnival freaks you'd see in black and white photos. I couldn't compare it to any animal I knew. It wasn't a bear, I can tell you that much. The thing, or things, were hunting us. I grabbed a flashlight from one of the loggers and did the dumbest thing possible. I followed the sounds. Call it adrenaline or stupidity, but my feet moved faster than my brain could keep up. I was running through the trees, chasing after shadows until I saw it, one of the loggers being dragged into the woods. He was screaming, but the sound was... cut short. I didn't stop to help him. And before you judge me, just know that by the time I saw what was dragging him... There was no helping anyone. It had this wolf-like snout, but the body... Man, the body was wrong. Twisted like it had broken every bone and healed crooked. Long arms with claws that looked like butcher knives, slashing through the trees as it moved with this eerie speed. And the smell. It was like rot. Like something that had been dead for days but was still walking around. I ran. That's all I could do. Back at camp, Bill was trying to radio for help, but the signal was dead. I grabbed the keys to one of the trucks and tried to convince the few remaining guys to come with me. Some did, but others... They were too far gone. Shock, maybe. They just sat there, muttering about how they'd seen it before, that it came with the woods. I didn't stick around to ask for more details. The drive out of there was the worst kind of nightmare. I kept seeing flashes of movement in the rearview mirror, hearing scratches against the side of the truck. But we made it to Powell Junction, though barely. 
The authorities didn't believe us, of course. I mean, what could we say? That some thing had torn apart two men and was stalking the woods. They sent out a team, but nothing came of it. They said it must have been a bear, an animal attack. But I know bears. This wasn't one. I didn't go back to the camp. Bill and a few others did, but I packed up my stuff and drove as far from Montana as I could. Every now and then I still check the news, looking for reports of missing people in those woods. There are always a few, but they never make the front page. The logging camp shut down shortly after, citing financial reasons. Sure. As for me, I'm back to working with computers. Safer that way. The only thing I have to worry about now is forgetting to update my firewall. But sometimes, late at night, I think about what happened out there, in the dark. I don't wonder what it was. I know what it was. And I know it's still out there, still hungry. The problem with hiking alone in the mountains, especially near the Montana-Idaho border in 1997, is that you never quite feel like you're alone. That's the first thing I noticed when I pulled into the gravel parking lot at the trailhead. I'm Paul Garrison, 41, and after my recent divorce, I needed some time away from the world. People kept saying it'd get easier, but they were full of it. That's the kind of thing people say when they're still clinging to the idea that life is supposed to make sense. I wasn't armed. I hadn't bothered to bring anything but the essentials. A flashlight, a map, some snacks, and my ancient Swiss army knife that probably wouldn't cut through warm butter anymore. The whole point was to get away from the world. Away from the chaos that was my life. Not to prepare for some apocalypse. I didn't own a gun because my ex-wife was paranoid about them, and frankly I'd never been a fan of them either. What could I possibly need it for out here? The trail was quiet, save for the occasional wind rustling through the trees or the crunch of my boots on the dirt path. The area was remote just the way I liked it. No tourists, no loud campers, just peace. After an hour of walking, the trail started to incline sharply, forcing me to slow down and take in the surroundings. Pine trees stretched up like columns, their tops lost somewhere above me and jagged cliffs stood sentinel over the valley below. A hiker passed by me going in the opposite direction, a woman with a big, lopsided backpack. She gave me a nod, a smile that seemed too forced for someone just out on a hike, but I didn't think much of it. She looked like she'd been through something and hey, who hadn't? Maybe she'd taken the trail to clear her head too. That's when I noticed something weird. Along the path, the pine needles were scattered in a way that didn't make sense, like something had swept through, dragging something heavy. It wasn't the kind of thing you could just pass off as natural. I knelt down to inspect it, my hand grazing the needles and dirt. Something big, something heavier than a deer, had been through here. I figured maybe someone was dragging their gear or injured, but I didn't see anyone around. It wasn't until I got deeper into the woods, where the trees started to press in tighter, that the feeling of being watched set in. That primal itch in the back of your neck, you know? The one that tells you something's not right, like when you're in a crowded bar and someone across the room is glaring at you for no reason. I chuckled to myself and kept moving. I was being ridiculous, wasn't I? Two hours in, I saw it. I should have turned back then, but I didn't. See, humans are stupid like that. We see something odd, something that doesn't fit the narrative of what we think the world is, and instead of running the other way, we get curious. Like we're trying to prove something to the universe. It was a clearing. Or what used to be one. The trees around it had been snapped. Not like by a storm, but twisted at odd angles. Some looked like they'd been wrenched apart by giant hands. In the middle of the clearing was a pile of bones. Big ones. The kind you'd expect to see in a museum, not here. They were bleached white. Cracked open like someone or something had been at them. My first thought? Wolves. But the cracks in the bones, they weren't right. They were too clean, too deliberate. No teeth marks, no tearing. Something else had done this. I don't know what possessed me to take another step into that clearing. Maybe I wanted to prove to myself that it was all in my head that this was just a natural thing. Maybe I thought I could chalk it up to poachers. But my feet moved on their own, stepping closer to the center of that mess. Then I heard it. A sound that didn't belong to the woods, 
like metal scraping stone. It sent a chill through my spine. I turned, hoping it was the wind, hoping it was anything but what I feared. What I saw, though, was far worse. The first thing I noticed was its size. It stood at least seven feet tall, hunched, but not like a man. Its limbs were too long, too twisted. The skin, or whatever you'd call it, was matted with fur, but not like any animal I knew. It was patchy, like it had been ripped off in places, exposing dark raw muscle underneath. And then its mouth, too wide, stretching where a jaw shouldn't stretch, opened, revealing rows of jagged, uneven teeth, like a bear's, but not. Bears don't have teeth that look like they've been carved with a hacksaw. I froze. Not the kind of freeze where you're thinking, oh, I'm dead, but the kind where your brain doesn't even process what's happening. It just stops. I might have screamed, I don't even know. What I do know is that the thing moved. Fast. I ran. I ran harder than I ever have in my life. Though I didn't even know where I was going. The trail was a blur beneath me. The trees whipping past as I tore through the underbrush. Branches snapping against my skin. That thing was behind me, but I didn't dare look back. I could hear it, though. The crashing. The breaking of branches under something far heavier than any man. At some point I tripped. Classic horror movie crap, right? Except I'm not in some slasher flick. I'm just a guy who took the wrong damn trail. I hit the ground hard. The wind knocked out of me. My hands scraping against rocks and dirt. And then silence. The thing had stopped. I couldn't hear it anymore. I pushed myself up, groaning from the pain. My legs were shaking and I could barely get them under me. My throat was dry, my chest burning from the run. I looked around, but there was no sign of it. Just when I thought maybe I'd outrun it, maybe it wasn't following me anymore, I heard a sound that stopped my heart. It wasn't behind me. It was above. I looked up and that thing, whatever it was, was perched in the branches of the pine tree right above me, its twisted limbs gripping the bark like a spider. Its face, or what was left of it, twisted into something like a smile, and for a second I swore I heard it laugh. My heart raced again, and I scrambled backward, tripping over myself. I heard a drop from the tree, a sickening thud as it landed on all fours, its eyes, no, not the eyes, tracking me. There was nowhere to go. The thing lunged forward, its mouth stretching open again as if it could swallow me whole. I thought I was done. There was nothing I could do. My legs had given out, my body too tired to keep running. That's when the rifle shot echoed through the trees, a sharp crack that rang through the forest like thunder. The thing stopped mid-leap, its body jerking violently as a bullet ripped through its chest. It stumbled back, snarling, if you could call it that, and before it could make another move, a second shot followed, hitting it square in the head. It collapsed, twitching for a moment before it went still. I turned my head toward the sound of boots crunching on the ground. The woman from earlier, the one with the big, lopsided backpack, stood there holding a rifle. Her face was grim, and she didn't say a word. She just walked over to the creature, nudged it with her boot, and then turned to me. You should leave, she said flatly. There are more of them. And with that, she started walking back the way I'd come, like this was just another day in the woods for her. I didn't argue. My legs were jelly, but I forced myself up, hobbling down the trail as fast as I could. When I got back to my car, I didn't even bother looking back. I threw my pack in the back seat, fired up the engine, and sped down that dirt road like I'd been chased out of hell. That night in a crappy motel off the highway, I thought about what had happened. I thought about the bones, the twisted trees, and that woman. But mostly I thought about how close I'd come to being another pile of bones in the middle of that clearing. I didn't sleep much that night, not because of nightmares, but because I knew I had to get the hell out of this part of the country. And fast. I heard later that some people had gone missing in those woods over the years. Hikers, campers, people who just disappeared, they never found their bodies. But now I think I know why. I didn't think twice when the invitation came. 1997, rural Wyoming, two hours from Jackson Hole, I was looking for a break from my mundane routine. My name's Will Garson, 
and for years I've been grinding away in an office cubicle, a place where fluorescent lights sucked the life out of me like an overzealous vampire. It was that kind of soul-crushing boredom that led me to accept the invite for a camping trip of a lifetime. My friend Dave had gotten into some outdoorsy kicks, so I figured why not? A weekend away from the office, the stress, and those damn emails. You know how it is. Dave was one of those guys who always got into new hobbies, hardcore. Last year it was deep sea fishing, and before that he tried handcrafting knives. The guy couldn't stick to one thing, but he swore up and down that this wilderness thing had finally clicked. He said the area we were headed to was untouched, a place no one else knew about. Looking back, I should have questioned why no one knew about it. We loaded up his truck, hauling gear I was unfamiliar with. I'll admit, I wasn't exactly the Bear Grylls type. Dave had packed enough for a small army, tents, freeze-dried meals, bear spray because apparently, Wyoming, and a brand new rifle he insisted was only for emergencies. I laughed it off at the time, told him if anyone got into trouble, I'd be the guy calling for an airlift while sipping a cold one in the tent. After an hour of bumpy back roads and passing the occasional ranch, we turned onto a dirt path so narrow it felt like we were driving straight into the wilderness. And I guess we were. I'd never felt so cut off from civilization. The further we went, the more claustrophobic the trees became. Until finally, the truck stopped. Dave got out and pointed down a steep incline. See that spot? We hike down there, follow the creek, and we'll set up camp near the clearing. As much as I hated the idea of walking with all this gear, I had to admit it was beautiful. Wild, untouched, and completely isolated. So we made our way down. At first, the hike was manageable, almost peaceful. Then the terrain got rougher, rockier, and Dave was powering ahead while I was silently cursing my desk job body. After a couple of hours, we reached the clearing, a wide, grassy patch bordered by thick woods and a river that trickled gently nearby. Dave slapped my back and said it was perfect. I didn't argue. It was, at least for the first couple of hours. By sunset, we had the tents up, fire roaring, and a couple of beers popped open. I was finally starting to relax, telling Dave a bad joke about how I was only out here to make sure he didn't get eaten by a grizzly. He laughed, but there was a moment, just a flicker, when his expression changed. Like he was about to say something and then thought better of it. We ate dinner, if you can call it that, out of packets. Dehydrated spaghetti. It was disgusting but I pretended to enjoy it because Dave looked way too proud of his culinary skills. By the time the stars came out, we were sitting by the fire nursing the last of the beer. The silence was incredible, but it wasn't peaceful for long. I noticed at first a faint sound in the distance, something moving in the trees, maybe a deer. But the longer I listened, the more I realized it wasn't moving like a deer. No quick steps, no bursts of speed. It was slow, deliberate. Dave, you hear that? He stared into the fire for a moment, then nodded. Yeah, it's nothing, man. Probably just an animal. That's when I knew something was off. Dave was always the type to jump at the chance to show off his knowledge about the outdoors, but this time he just brushed it off, which made me more uneasy. An hour passed, and we kept hearing it. Slow, almost dragging. I was starting to wonder if I was imagining things, but every now and then I'd see Dave glance into the trees his face unreadable. Eventually, we called it a night. I climbed into my tent, listening to the faint rustle of the wind, mixed with the occasional snap of a branch. Sleep didn't come easy. I kept waking up, convinced I heard something creeping closer. At one point, I thought I saw a shadow move outside my tent, but I convinced myself it was just the fire playing tricks. Then I woke up to the sound of Dave's voice, barely a whisper outside the tent. Will... Come out here. I sat up, blinking in the darkness. What is it? Come out here, man. Now. Something in his tone sent a jolt of fear through me. I grabbed my jacket, slipped out of the tent, and found him standing by the fire, the rifle in his hand. His face was pale, his eyes darting between the trees. What the hell is going on? I asked. Dave pointed toward the woods. There's something out there. Now my first instinct was to ask if he'd been drinking more than I thought, but the look in his eyes told me he was dead serious. We both listened, 
and sure enough, there it was again. That dragging sound. Closer this time. Slow. Deliberate. And then, a deep thud, like something heavy being dropped. I froze. Dave raised the rifle, stepping toward the edge of the clearing. Stay behind me. I didn't argue. For the first time in my life, I was glad someone had brought a gun. We stood there, the fire crackling behind us, as that sound kept moving closer, inch by inch. My heart was pounding so loud I was sure whatever was out there could hear it. And then, it stopped. Silence. I don't know what I was expecting. Maybe for it to just turn around and go away. But then I saw it. Something in the trees. A shape. Tall. Too tall. And then it moved. Not like a bear, not like any animal I'd ever seen. It moved with this strange, unnatural grace, like it was gliding between the trees. Dave aimed the rifle, finger on the trigger, but before he could fire, the thing charged. I've never seen anything move so fast. One second it was in the trees, the next it was on top of us. I ran. I'm not proud of it, but I ran. Behind me I heard the gunshot, followed by a sickening crunch, and then Dave's scream. I'll never forget that sound. The scream. I didn't stop running until my legs gave out somewhere along the creek. I fell, gasping for air, trying to convince myself that I'd wake up and this would all be some messed up dream. But it wasn't. When I finally managed to drag myself back to the campsite, Dave was gone. The rifle lay broken on the ground and the fire had burned down to embers. The grass where he had stood was stained dark and there were drag marks leading into the trees. I stood there for what felt like hours trying to decide what to do. There was no cell service, no one around for miles. And then I saw it again at the edge of the clearing, just watching. Tall, thin, its skin pale and tight like something that had been left out in the sun too long. I don't know what it was. I don't want to know. I grabbed what I could, my bag, some food, anything that wasn't too heavy, and I ran. I didn't stop until I reached Dave's truck. The keys were still in it, and I drove out of there as fast as I could. When I got to the nearest town, I called the cops. They found the campsite, found the blood, but they never found Dave. They said it was probably a bear. A bear. Whatever it was, it wasn't a bear. But you know, whatever helps them sleep at night. As for me, I don't sleep much anymore. But I did get one good joke out of it. Turns out the wilderness isn't as relaxing as they make it seem on TV. Guess I'll stick to my office after all. I remember the last time I thought I had control over something. It was 2003, and I was just another guy who'd gotten out of one bad situation, thinking the universe owed me a break. That was before I ended up in a secluded patch of Texas land I rented from an old friend. His family had owned it for decades, miles of untamed scrubland just south of the Davis Mountains, in the middle of nowhere. I figured it'd be a good spot to clear my head. My name is Donnie, and I worked as an electrician for most of my life. After a divorce that drained me both emotionally and financially, I needed to disappear for a bit, just go where people wouldn't bother me. I didn't tell anyone where I was going, didn't leave a forwarding address, nothing. Just loaded up my old truck, packed a few tools, and decided I'd spend a few months in the wild. It was a pretty decent plan, at least until I realized I wasn't alone out there. So yeah, 2003. Funny how you get those gut feelings that tell you things are about to go wrong. Mine hit me on day three, when I was already regretting the idea of roughing it. The place was isolated as hell. I was used to fixing people's lighting problems in their cozy suburban homes, but out here there was nothing. No cell service, no landline, and the nearest town was a two-hour drive away. I kept myself busy by fixing up the old cabin on the land. Nothing special, just four walls, a roof, and some long-forgotten memories. My friend hadn't been down here in years, but he mentioned something about his grandfather once using it as a hunting shack. Seemed like as good a place as any to hunker down, or so I thought. The first night I chalked the noises up to coyotes. Texas is full of them, especially out in the scrub. I figured if I ignored the scratching sounds outside long enough, they'd stop. But when they didn't stop, I convinced myself it was just the wind. 
maybe some tree branches scraping against the cabin's outer walls. Sure, that made sense. It wasn't until the second night that I realized something wasn't right. It started with the smell. It hit like a punch in the face, sour and metallic, like rusting iron mixed with rotting meat. I checked everything. The cabin was old, sure, but there was nothing that could have been causing that stench. No dead animals, no garbage, just that overwhelming smell that hung in the air, thick enough to taste. I shrugged it off as some weird quirk of the land. Bad soil, maybe. Or maybe I wasn't used to the way the wilderness smelled without all the distractions of city life. Yeah, that had to be it. It wasn't until night three that things escalated. I had set a fire outside, more for comfort than warmth. The cabin didn't have electricity, so after the sun dipped below the horizon, I was left with nothing but the flickering flames and the pitch-black darkness surrounding me. That's when I saw it. Or rather, saw him. At first, I thought it was a coyote sniffing around the tree line. Its silhouette seemed lanky, too thin to be a healthy animal. I stared at it, waiting for it to move closer, curious if it was going to try and scavenge some of the food I had left out. But it didn't move. It stood there, just outside the firelight, its limbs too long, its posture too wrong. The thing stood on two legs, hunched over like some kind of animal that had forgotten how to be a man. I wasn't sure how long I stared at it, trying to convince myself my eyes were playing tricks on me. I even blinked a few times, thinking the dark shapes would shift into something more recognizable. Nope. The longer I stared, the more certain I was that whatever it was, it wasn't natural. I decided not to stick around to find out what it was. I'm no hero. Hell, I'm barely brave enough to open my electric bills, let alone confront some long-limbed weird creature in the middle of the night. So I did what any sane person would do. I grabbed my flashlight and hauled myself into the cabin. That night, the scratching started again, but this time it was louder. Closer. I could hear it right outside the window. Slow, deliberate scratching like nails on a chalkboard. I thought about grabbing the gun I had packed, but of course, I didn't bring one. Why? Because, like an idiot, I thought I was just going camping. The scratching turned to tapping. The tapping turned into something far worse. It was a kind of shuffling, like something was dragging itself around the outside of the cabin. And then came the laughter. Not a normal laugh, either. It sounded human, but it wasn't right. It was too sharp, too breathy like someone who hadn't spoken in years was suddenly trying to force laughter out of a mouth that didn't know how anymore. The rational part of me was telling me that I was sleep-deprived, paranoid, imagining things. But there was another part, an older, more primal part, that knew this was real. I wasn't alone out there. I could feel it in my bones. I didn't sleep that night. At some point, the laughter stopped. The scratching faded. The morning light spilled in through the cracks in the cabin's walls, and I finally felt brave enough to check outside. Big mistake. The first thing I noticed was the smell again, stronger this time, suffocating. Then I saw the tracks. They weren't animal prints, not exactly. They were long and thin, more like drag marks than actual footprints, as if something had been crawling around the cabin all night. And there were dozens of them, circling the place like it had been hunting me waiting for the right moment. I tried calling my friend, tried calling anyone, but of course there was no signal. I didn't even bother trying to drive out that day. Something deep down told me I wouldn't make it far before whatever was out there found me. That night, I tried staying awake again, but my body betrayed me. I don't know when I drifted off, but when I woke up, the sun had just begun to rise. I heard the sound of something heavy hitting the ground outside, like a bag of rocks being dropped from a height. My heart was racing before I even reached the door. Lying in front of the cabin, half covered in dirt, was a deer, or at least what used to be a deer. Its body had been shredded, bones sticking out in unnatural angles, its skin hanging like strips of wet fabric. The worst part wasn't the gore. No, it was the way the thing had been arranged almost like it had been put on display. Its legs had been twisted and stretched, bent backward like some sick joke. I backed up into the cabin, slamming the door shut. 
my hands shaking so hard I could barely lock the bolt. I knew I couldn't stay there. Not with whatever that thing was out there. I spent the next few hours throwing my stuff back into the truck. My plan was simple. Get the hell out. I'd drive through the night if I had to, straight to the nearest gas station, where there were people. I didn't care if I left the cabin in shambles. I just needed to get out. But plans don't always work the way you want them to. As soon as I tried to start the truck, the engine sputtered and died. I cursed under my breath, popped the hood, and checked the battery, the fuel lines, everything I knew how to fix. Nothing. That's when I heard the footsteps again, slow and deliberate. I glanced over my shoulder, and that's when I saw it in full daylight. It wasn't human, not entirely. Its body was gaunt, almost skeletal, and its skin looked like leather stretched too tight over bones. It had no hair, just raw patches of skin and muscle, and it moved with a jerky, unnatural rhythm, like it wasn't used to walking on two legs. I froze. Every survival instinct in me screamed to run, but there was nowhere to go. The thing cocked its head to one side, like it was studying me, like I was some kind of puzzle it was trying to figure out. And then it smiled. Or at least, it tried to. Its lips peeled back in a grotesque imitation of a human grin. But there was nothing human in it. I backed up slowly, praying to God the truck would start. When I turned the key, the engine roared to life. I didn't think, I just slammed my foot on the gas and peeled out of there, the tires kicking up dirt and rocks. As I sped down the road, I could see it in the rearview mirror, just standing there, watching. The drive to the nearest town felt like it took a lifetime, but I didn't stop. When I finally reached civilization, I parked outside a diner, shaking like a leaf. I didn't tell anyone what I'd seen. Who would believe me? Some story about a long-limbed thing in the woods? They'd think I was crazy. Hell, maybe I was. But I know what I saw. I didn't go back to that land. I left everything, tools, supplies, the cabin, and drove straight to my brother's house in Houston. Every now and then, though, I think about what might still be out there, crawling around in the dark, waiting. And then I remember the deer. That wasn't for me. That was a message. That thing was just having fun. A man told me once that you can handle anything in life as long as you learn to laugh at yourself. Good advice, I suppose. But when you're stuck in the backcountry with a broken down truck and no cell signal, it gets harder to see the humor. Especially when you're two hours from the nearest town and starting to wish you'd taken up fishing instead of hunting. It was 1997, and I was driving through the depths of the Sierra Nevadas, trying to find a place called Big Flat. If you haven't heard of it, don't worry. You're not alone. Most people wouldn't dream of heading there. In fact, the locals in Colfax gave me one of those sideways looks when I mentioned it, like they knew something I didn't, but didn't feel like sharing. I brushed it off, chalked it up to superstition or local legends. I've heard enough of those to last a lifetime. Name's Ben Hargrove. I used to sell insurance, if you can believe that. The hours were long, the pay was decent, but it drove me nuts. Too many numbers, too many people complaining about how their cat destroyed their TV and what were asterisk we asterisk going to do about it. So I switched things up, started a small game hunting business out of Truckee. It wasn't glamorous, but it was mine. And I didn't have to listen to anyone's cat stories anymore. So there I was, in a truck that cost me more in repairs than it was worth, trying to find this supposedly great hunting spot I'd heard about through a friend of a friend. It wasn't on any map I'd seen, and the directions I was given were as vague as a politician's promise. The road, if you could call it that, was barely more than a dirt track. Trees loomed on either side, and the sky was hidden by a thick canopy of pines. It felt like driving into the belly of some ancient beast, the kind you only hear about in fairy tales. My buddy Ted had warned me not to go alone, said it was bad luck or some crap like that. Ted was a superstitious guy, though, and I figured he was just trying to mess with me. About a mile or so into the woods, the truck started acting up. A sputter here, a cough there, until finally it just gave up. I swore under my breath, got out, and popped the hood, not that I knew what I was looking for. The engine looked like it always did, a big mess of parts I didn't understand. I grabbed my toolbox from the back and started fiddling with it, 
hoping the universe would take pity on me. It didn't. After about 20 minutes of trying everything I could think of, I realized I was stranded. I didn't have a radio, no cell phone signal, and the closest town was probably a two-hour hike back. I thought about camping out in the truck, waiting until daylight, but then I saw something out of the corner of my eye. Movement, deep in the woods. I froze, squinting into the dark, but whatever it was had disappeared before I could get a good look. It could have been a deer or a raccoon, I told myself. But there was this feeling gnawing at me, like something was asterisk off asterisk. I wasn't the kind of guy who got spooked easily, but this was different. There was a stillness to the air, a kind of oppressive quiet that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I grabbed my rifle from the truck, slung it over my shoulder, and decided to hike out. It was either that or wait for something to happen, and I didn't like feeling helpless. The trail was barely visible in the fading light, and I could hear my own breathing, heavy and uneven. I tried to make a joke out of it, telling myself I was probably just freaked out because I was stuck in the middle of nowhere, but it didn't help. The forest got thicker as I moved deeper in, and I realized I was off course. The trail I'd been following had all but disappeared, and now I was just pushing through undergrowth, trying to get my bearings. I stopped to catch my breath, and that's when I heard it. A rustling sound coming from behind me. I turned, rifle at the ready, but there was nothing there. Just the trees and the wind. I waited a minute, listening, but the sound didn't come back. I forced a laugh, telling myself I was hearing things, but the truth was, I wasn't so sure. I'd spent enough time in the woods to know when something wasn't right. I kept walking, quicker now, wanting to put some distance between me and whatever was back there. My footsteps echoed in the silence, and I had the unsettling feeling that I wasn't alone. Every few minutes I'd stop and listen, but all I heard was my own breath. Until I didn't. The next noise I heard wasn't a rustle or a snap of a twig. It was low, deep, like something big moving through the brush. Something that wasn't too concerned with keeping quiet. I stopped dead in my tracks, gripping the rifle like a lifeline. And then I saw it. At first it was just a shadow, shifting between the trees. But as it got closer, I realized it wasn't a shadow. It was something else. Something wrong. I don't know how else to describe it. It moved like an animal, but its shape wasn't right. Too big, too fast, and when it stepped into the clearing, my heart stopped. It was like a wolf, but bigger, much bigger. Its fur was matted and dark, and its limbs were twisted, almost as if they didn't belong to the same creature. It moved on all fours, but hunched in a way that suggested it could stand upright if it wanted to. I didn't have time to process what I was seeing because it saw me too. And it was coming. I fired. The shot rang out, echoing through the trees, but the thing didn't stop. It barely even flinched. I fired again, but I might as well have been shooting at air. It was on me in seconds, and I did the only thing I could think of. I ran. Now, I'm not the fastest guy in the world, but I ran like I had the devil himself on my heels. And maybe I did. I could hear it behind me, crashing through the undergrowth, gaining on me. I didn't dare look back didn't want to see how close it was. I just kept running, hoping I could lose it, but I knew I couldn't outrun it. Not for long. My lungs were burning, my legs screaming in protest, but I didn't stop. I could feel it, close now, so close I could almost feel its breath on my neck. I stumbled, tripped over a root, and went down hard. My rifle skidded out of reach, and I knew I was done for. I rolled onto my back, expecting to see the thing looming over me, but it wasn't there. I scrambled to my feet, heart pounding, and looked around. The woods were silent again and the thing was gone. Just like that. One minute, it was chasing me, and the next, it had vanished. I didn't waste any time wondering why. I grabbed my rifle and took off again, moving slower this time, but not stopping. I needed to get out, and I needed to get out asterisk now asterisk. The sun was starting to set, casting long shadows through the trees, and I knew I was running out of daylight. I kept moving, every step feeling like it could be my last, but the thing didn't come back. After what felt like hours, I broke through the trees and found myself on a dirt road. My truck was nowhere in sight, but I didn't care. I wasn't about to go back for it. I followed the road, not caring where it led as long as it took me away from those woods. My legs felt like lead, but I didn't stop, not until I saw the lights of a cabin up ahead. 
I stumbled to the door and pounded on it, praying someone was home. The door swung open and an old man stood there, shotgun in hand. He took one look at me and shook his head. You saw it, didn't you? He asked. I didn't answer. I didn't need to. The look on my face must have told him everything. Come inside, he said, stepping aside. I didn't argue. I stumbled inside and collapsed into a chair, my body finally giving in to the exhaustion. He didn't ask me any questions, didn't offer me any explanations. He just sat down across from me and started cleaning his shotgun. After a while, he spoke again, his voice low and even. People come out here thinking they can handle it. They think they can fight it, but they don't understand. It's not something you can kill. Not with a gun, anyway. I didn't say anything. I couldn't. I just sat there, staring at the floor, trying to wrap my head around what had happened. The old man stood up, walked to the window, and peered out into the night. It'll be back, he said almost to himself. It always comes back. I stayed the night in that cabin, didn't sleep a wink. By morning, the old man had packed me a bag and pointed me toward the nearest town. I left without saying much, but I knew I wasn't going to tell anyone about what I'd seen. Who would believe me? I don't go hunting anymore. Don't go into the woods at all if I can help it. And I never did go back for that truck. My life has been one long stretch of sarcasm, poor decisions, and doing things because I thought, hey, it couldn't get worse. One of those decisions was back in 2002 when I decided to leave the daily grind in Phoenix and take up hiking to, you know, clear my mind. Never thought I'd clear it permanently. Name's Logan Sarno, and let's just say I wasn't built for this stuff. My friends always said I had the survival skills of a wet paper bag. I couldn't even keep a cactus alive, but hey, I bought gear, watched a couple of videos, and figured I'd be fine. I mean, it's just walking in nature, right? How hard can it be? Turns out, pretty damn hard. The thing was, I wanted out of the city for a while. My job in advertising was eating my soul, and yeah, I know, that's not a high-stakes profession like being a cop or surgeon. But every day was like groundhog hell. Same client complaints, same deadlines. My boss, Veronica, always looked at me like she was one spilled coffee cup away from ending my entire existence. So hiking seemed like the escape I needed. There was this place somewhere up in the North Cascades. A buddy of mine mentioned it at a party once, said it was pretty much uncharted. That's what sold me on it. That, and the fact that the trip sounded like a half-assed adventure for someone with zero experience. It was supposed to be untouched wilderness, but honestly, the way my buddy described it, it sounded like no one in their right mind would go there. Perfect. That's where it all started going sideways. I parked my car at a trailhead about 20 miles out from some town I couldn't even remember the name of. The plan was simple. Hike in, stay a night, hike out, feel like Bear grills, tell everyone at work I survived the wilderness. I'd even practiced my humble brag, but by the time I realized I had no clue where I was going, I was about three hours in. And let's be real, my ego wasn't going to let me turn back. The forest was thick. I mean, absurdly thick. Ever seen those old cartoons where the trees look like they're leaning in, whispering secrets about how you'll probably die out there? Yeah, it was like that. Every step felt like it was being watched, but not in the wildlife is curious way. More like the something sizing you up way. At first I laughed it off. What was I, paranoid? But then I came across a clearing that didn't look right. And by it didn't look right. I mean, the ground was ripped up like a blender had gone to town on it. The trees around it had this weird, deep, clawed-up bark. I squatted down, trying to get a closer look. The marks were too big for any animal I'd heard of. Bears, sure, they can do some damage, but this? These marks had an unsteady, erratic pattern, like something was dragging its claws through just for the hell of it. I thought about taking a picture, but decided that was a waste of time. People on the internet would call it a hoax, and I wasn't about to explain myself to conspiracy nuts. Then, I heard it. The sound that stopped me cold. It wasn't an animal call or the wind through the trees. It was a crunch, a bone-snapping crunch from behind me, 
followed by a low, dragging sound like something massive was pulling itself across the forest floor. I turned slowly because at that point, I figured it was better to see death coming at me than get blindsided. There, standing maybe twenty feet away, was the most mangled excuse for a wolf I'd ever seen. It had the general shape of one, if a wolf had gone through a blender and stitched itself back together using a twisted sewing kit. Its fur was patchy and matted, and it had these massive, deformed legs that looked like they were built more for crushing than running. I'm not a hunter or anything, but the thing was too big, too jacked up, too wrong to exist. I didn't breathe, didn't move. It stared at me, its head twitching in sharp jerks like a malfunctioning robot. And then it lowered itself, getting ready to pounce. I was dead. I knew it. I did the only logical thing I could think of. I ran like hell. Yeah, genius move, Logan. Run from the massive wolf mutant thing. I could practically hear my track coach from high school laughing at me as I stumbled through the undergrowth, tripping over rocks and roots like an idiot. I glanced back once and it was moving. Too fast. Way faster than I expected. Like it was hopping rather than running, its back legs pushing off with these sickening crunches. I didn't make it far before I slammed face first into something that wasn't a tree. My head snapped back. And when I looked up, I saw a guy. A man, dressed like he'd been living out here for years, covered in dirt. His clothes a mismatched collection of rags and animal hides. He looked just as messed up as the wolf thing. His skin had this weird pallor, and his eyes... Okay, let's not talk about those. He smiled, though, this big toothy grin, and held up what looked like a bone. A human bone. I tried to scramble back, but another one of them stepped out from behind the trees... A woman, if you could call her that. Though her face looked like it had been bashed in one too many times, she held a jagged knife dripping with something dark and sticky. And that's when I saw it. A body, or what was left of it, slumped against a tree. I don't know who they were, but they weren't alive anymore. Bits of them were missing, like they had been carved up for parts. The man let out this guttural laugh. Yeah, I said it. And I bolted again, not caring where I was running. At this point, I just needed to put distance between me and that psycho pair. But the thing is, I wasn't just running from them. The wolf thing had caught up. I heard the snap of its jaws before I felt it, a sharp, searing pain as its teeth sank into my leg. I screamed and kicked back, the adrenaline helping me shake free just long enough to keep going. My vision was blurring from the blood loss, but I kept moving, desperate to find something, anything, that would get me out of this nightmare. I don't know how far I made it, but eventually I stumbled upon what I can only describe as their den. It was a cave, or at least a hole in the side of a rocky hill, littered with bones, clothing, and other things I didn't want to look at too closely. And there were more of them. The people things. They were crouched around something, gnawing on what looked like a fresh kill. I backed up slowly, holding my breath, but my foot landed on a loose rock, sending it clattering down the slope. They turned in unison eyes gleaming with a sick sort of hunger. I didn't even wait for them to come after me. I ran, despite the pain, despite knowing I probably wasn't going to make it. Somehow, I managed to find my way back to the car, bloody, broken, and delirious. I didn't stop to check if they were following. I just drove, as fast as I could, away from that place. I still don't know what they were, those things in the forest. Some mutated animals, some backwoods cannibal cult, but here's the kicker, the part that makes it even worse. When I got home and looked up that area online, I found an old report from a missing hiker case back in the 70s. The description of the scene? Torn up ground, claw marks and bones, but no bodies. Guess I was lucky. I'm not going back, though. Ever. Anyway, it turns out I'm not a hiker. I've never been the type to scare easily, but 2002 had a way of proving me wrong. My name's Wade Harkins, and I've spent most of my life guiding hunting trips out in the Wyoming wilderness. If you've ever been out that way, you'd know it's a land that can swallow you whole if you're not careful. But it's also a place where you learn a lot about life, about things people like to pretend don't exist. I was guiding a small group up the backcountry near Dubois when everything went sideways. We'd been out for a week already, no major issues, 
until the third day. The hunters I was guiding weren't anything special. Three city guys who probably thought deer would walk right up to them, ask to be shot. But they had money. And money means you don't ask questions, you just guide. We were setting up camp along a ridge with a view of the valley. Pretty scenic, but I've always found that the mountains had a strange way of making a man feel small. One of the hunters, this guy named Pete, was grumbling about the cold. And I was about to tell him Wyoming doesn't care about your complaints when we heard something that froze us all in place. At first it sounded like a wild animal, maybe a deer or a bear crashing through the trees. But the sound wasn't right. It was too fast, too chaotic. Then, nothing. Dead silence. The kind that makes you realize something's watching you. Pete, being the idiot he was, waved it off like it was nothing. Probably a damn moose or something, he said, chuckling. But it wasn't a moose. I've heard enough animals in my time to know it wasn't anything I could explain. The rest of the night went on without incident, but that silence never left me. It sat there in the back of my mind, gnawing at me. I kept telling myself to shake it off. After all, you don't make a career out of guiding people into the wild by jumping at every shadow. Next morning I noticed the hunters seemed to have shaken off the weirdness of the previous night. They were back to being their cocky selves, talking about how many tags they'd fill by day's end. We headed further up the ridge, into an area less traveled. The locals avoided it, which meant good game. But it also meant I had to stay alert. The land up there wasn't forgiving, and if you got lost, it wasn't going to give you back. By noon, we split up. Pete went with two others down toward a lower valley while I stayed with a guy named Troy. We weren't seeing much. Signs of game, but nothing recent. But that silence was back, following us like a bad memory. No birds, no wind. Just quiet like nature itself had packed up and left. Troy didn't notice. He was too busy fumbling with his rifle, cursing under his breath. I told him we'd head back to camp soon, but he was too stubborn to listen, thinking this trip was going to be his big hunting story. That's when we heard it again, those same crashing noises closer this time, like something big was tearing through the underbrush. I signaled for Troy to stay still, and to his credit he listened. My heart was pounding in my chest, but not out of fear more like a heightened awareness. Something was out there, something not normal. Suddenly, Troy fired his rifle, just blasted off a shot into the trees without warning. I whipped around yelling at him to hold his fire, but he was already running toward where he shot. I sprinted after him, crashing through the trees, calling out for him to stop. The further we ran, the more wrong everything felt. The air felt heavier, the trees seemed darker, closer together. Then I saw it, something lying on the ground in front of Troy. He was standing over it, shaking. When I got closer, my stomach turned. It wasn't a deer or any animal I'd ever seen. It was human, or it had been. The body was torn apart, scattered across the ground in pieces that looked more like the aftermath of a butcher's shop than anything belonging in the wilderness. I didn't want to look too long, but my mind caught bits. Limbs, blood-soaked clothes, what used to be a face. Troy was babbling incoherently, his eyes wide, his gun slack at his side. I grabbed him, shook him hard enough to snap him out of it. We have to go, now. He nodded, still in shock. I didn't even think twice. We needed to get back to the others, figure out what the hell was going on. But just as we turned, something moved behind the trees. I didn't get a good look, but it was big faster than anything I've ever seen move out here. It darted between the trees like a ghost, leaving behind the sound of branches snapping. Troy froze, but I pulled him along. Move! I shouted. We ran. I don't even remember how far, but the whole time I felt it, whatever it was, following us, hunting us. When we got back to camp, Pete and the others were already there, and they weren't alone. Another guy, someone I didn't recognize, was lying on the ground, dead. He was torn up just like the body Troy and I had found. Blood everywhere, his insides on the outside. Pete was in shock too, muttering about how it came out of nowhere, how he barely got away. I checked my watch. It was only 4 p.m., but the sky was already turning dark, the shadows creeping in faster than they should have. Something was seriously wrong. 
We gathered what we could and moved as quickly as possible down the trail, but the thing, whatever it was, followed us the whole way. I could hear it, just beyond the trees, keeping pace with us. Pete tried firing a few rounds into the trees, but all he did was waste ammo. By the time we made it halfway down the ridge, night had fallen completely. The moon was hidden behind clouds, and we were forced to use flashlights. That's when it attacked. I'll never forget the sound, something like a tree being split in half, followed by a guttural snarl that seemed to come from everywhere at once. It hit us hard, faster than we could react. Troy went down first. It dragged him off into the trees before anyone could even fire a shot. We heard him scream, but only for a moment, then silence. Pete panicked, firing blindly into the woods, yelling like a madman. I tried to keep him calm, but it was no use. The thing grabbed him, too, this time right in front of me. It was huge, covered in matted fur, like some twisted mix between a bear and something else. It stood on two legs, but it moved like an animal, fast, powerful. I raised my gun, but it was gone before I could even aim. The other guy, a hunter named Clark, just stood there, dumbfounded. He didn't even run. The thing took him too, right from the spot he was standing, dragging him into the darkness. I didn't stick around, I ran. And I kept running until I hit the trailhead where the truck was parked. I drove back into town, barely able to breathe, my mind racing. No one would believe me if I told them what happened. Hell, I wasn't even sure if I believed it myself. But the bodies, the blood, it was all real. I got back to Dubois and reported what happened. The cops went out to search the area, but they didn't find much. Some blood, some torn clothes, but no bodies. They said it must have been a bear, maybe a mountain lion. But I know what I saw, and it wasn't any animal I've ever encountered before. There are places in these mountains people aren't meant to go, places that don't care about your experience or your skill with a gun. I'm not one to spin tales, but if you ever find yourself up near Dubois, do yourself a favor, stick to the roads, and don't go wandering off into the woods.